Uh, we live. Is that, that's public enemy. You know public enemy? Are we live? Uh, vaguely. Are we live? Vaguely. This time around, people, the revolution will not be televised. Step. We have you uh, for your viewing pleasure, but you know what he's watching yet, right? <laughs> so I can just act ridiculous. Um, is anybody watching? I don't think they are. We have for you the big star of the non sequitur show. Yeah, you thought it was Steve. It isn't. It's Kyle, the big star of the non sequitur show. Kyle Curtis. Woo! Who, woo! Who, who would think that that would be Steve? Um, would any serious would probably think it was Steve. Serious yeah. would go, no, it's Steve. It's the big star. Of the <laughs> Everybody else would be like, no, it's Kyle. Good point. Everybody else would have it straight. Well, serious would get it wrong. Uh, straight is not something that I do very well. No, you do not. But we will get into that as as the as the show progresses. Um, okay. Introduce yourself. Everybody probably knows who you are, but tell us who you are. Ah, they probably don't. And if they don't, it's a it's a good thing. It's good for their health. Good for their blood pressure. Um, if you do know who I am, then I'm the person responsible for uh, massive face palming, uh, angry flat earthers, pseudoscience. Uh, uh, aficionados. Um, if you don't know what non sequitur is, just stay that way. Don't go anywhere near the channel. <laughs> don't even, don't even, you don't want to know because it's just, it's just, it's, it's non sequitur. Okay. So the first, the first thing I want to start with is uh, I saw some of your comedy act. Uh, so you posted a link to it, I guess, on the non sequiturs. What's the deal with that? How did you, how did that, how'd that go? Start with that. Um, well, I was going through some of my old things on my own jump drives, and I, and I found several of my very first early stand-up comedy routines. And when I was in high school, I was the first, uh, I was the first, I think, class, like, it was the first year they started doing senior projects, which is a thing they do widely now where you have a, like a set thing that you work on your entire senior year. So right. some people would work on restoring cars. Some people, you know, did farming. Some people did, uh, you know, if they were wanted to go to medical school, they shadowed a doctor, but you had to get a mentor. You had to have a, um, a presentation or you had to produce something. And it was basically to, you're, you're learning on a trade or, or something that you were really interested in. And um, a lot of people did restoring cars, you know, they would yeah. get an old and, and then do that well fireman I, football player yeah yeah exactly uh, i was fascinated by the johnny carsons and david letterman and and those guys and just love stand up love stand up uh, bill hicks was one of my i uh, still is one of my idols even though he morphed into uh, alex jones which is a a tragedy in itself but um i chose to do my own stand up and I was a senior in high school, and, and I called up this – there were two comedy clubs in my hometown, the Funny Bone and the Comedy Zone. I called right. up the Comedy Zone, and I didn't get anything back. But I called up the Funny Bone, and the manager there said, yeah, we'd love to do that. Let's do it. So that's a commitment for like a year. So on the weekends, I literally got to spend every weekend in a comedy club with some of the funniest uh, – big names would come through there, but I just got to – sit and hang out and watch the car. Wow. And, yeah. And um, that was, you know, you had to spend so many hours a week with your mentor and on your project. So all of these counted towards my, um, my hours. high school sure. credit, high school credit for that. Yeah. Well, it was, it was part of the project, you know, that you, you, if you don't pass your senior project, you don't get your um, plums. So this is like a, a huge deal. And um, my presentation or what my actual physical product would be was i put on a johnny carson style show for the entire school called the um the school night show and we did we we raised we sold tickets raised money for relay for life um i had a bunch of the comedians that were local that would come through the comedy club onto the um that johnny carson style show that i did and it was fantastic and so the uh the manager said all right look we uh you know we we spent all this time with you we did uh all of this mentoring, I, I want you to do one, come up and, and watch one more show at the, the Funny Bone, and um, then we can part ways or you can still come up or whatever. But anyway, there was no obligation there because the project was over. So 
I went on a Tuesday and um, I walked in like I normally did, sat at my normal table, and the manager came and said, I need to talk to you in, in the office for a second. And so I go. Oh, and, and he's going to tell you that you could be a star. He's going to tell you you're really good or not. Not quite. Not quite. Okay. Um, <laughs> he, uh, you know that, that saying, if you want to learn how to swim, throw them in the deep end? Yes. Well, he said, okay, you know all those, those hours that we spent up here together? Do you know all the tickets that I comped for you and your friends? Um, you know, all the, the, the green room meetings with those comedians. Just naming off every perk that he had given me as part of this project. And I said, yeah, 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 yeah. And he said, well, I'm going to need you to pay me back for that. And I said, what do you mean pay you back for that? And he said, okay, you got two options, all right? You can either pay me the money that all of that comes up to, or you can get your ass up on that stage tonight and we'll call it even. Cool. And, Did yeah. you freak out? Oh, y- yes. I was, uh, I was going crazy. I mean, that's, the, that's probably the most nervous I've been in my entire life because it's a packed house. I think there was 175 people there. And I've never been on a stand-up comedy stage before. That's a different, you know, kind of element. You're uh, right. If you don't command that stage when you first get on there, then the audience will eat you alive. So I had a couple of jokes. Yeah, I'll bet. We had written for my show that I did at the high school, but it was geared more towards high school. Anyway, long story short, I went up there. I bombed. I ate it. It was terrible. I got no laughs. Um, no one wow. Even laughed. No one even clapped whenever I uh, I got I got finished. I mean, that's just how how bad I did. But it was the greatest feeling I had ever had in my life, and I was hooked. I, that there was something about being on that stage and looking at everybody, looking up at me, and me trying to figure out a way to connect with them and to uh, manipulate their emotions in a way that they laughed. And there was just something about that that I have had ever since. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit of my background in the same subject, and then I'll let you go further. Uh, I've done improv. I was actually kind of professional, not professional, but in the city. I was in an improv troupe for two years, two and a half years. And my wife insists that she could be a stand-up comedian, and I kind of have believers. She used to hang out in uh, Catch a Rising Star way back when and like, she dated a bunch of now famous comedians at the time and like hung out with them. Um, did you try to break into professional comedy after that? Um, I, did you, cause I, I saw an act. The act I saw was looked like you were doing, you were on a circuit, right? Or I was, um, act- I, I wouldn't call it professional. Uh, what, what I did was it's kind of similar to what I, um, the, the, the YouTube thing here. There was a, I saw that uh, there were several clubs, like dance clubs, where I live in uh, in Greensboro. And okay, so this is there, this is in this is in your local area, right? Yeah, South Carolina, and, and, right? Uh, North Carolina, North Carolina, North Carolina. And um, th- there are several big clubs that that had the potential to pack out with an audience. I mean, they they there were it was a college town. There's like eight colleges in Greensboro. And so you have that untapped resource, but only two comedy clubs. And so what I did was I approached the, uh, the manager at uh, Green Street, which was a dance club in downtown Greensboro. And I said, look, you guys aren't open on Wednesday nights. Why don't you let me rent the club or, or you take a, you know, a cut at the door and we'll do a comedy night there. Oh, that's and, cool. And so it took off. We called it, um, we called it uh, sit down or stand up. And it was like a, for anybody that wanted to do like open mics or you wanted to try it out, you would come and you'd get your, your, your time on stage. And we did it with an, like an elimination round. So the audience would vote and the winners of that particular night would come back the next week and headline. So you, you really kind of got, it built like a community around it. And so from there, I got approached by a couple comedy clubs and um, started, I did a, a, like a very, very, very light tour up the East Coast, up and down the East Coast with the Funny Bone, the, uh, the cool. club that I did my project with. Um, so yeah, it was a good time. Uh, there, there just came a point to where uh, I started getting into the, the culinary field. Like I was really, really, really into 
uh, being a chef and I had to make a decision. If I yeah, wanted. like a real, like a serious chef, right? Yeah. Because yeah, my, but, my buddy did that and it was like 60, 67 hour weeks or something like that. Like right, it's yeah. a real commitment. Absolutely. And, and comedy is the same way. If uh, you're, you're going to be touring up and down all of these uh, cities that you've never heard of, staying in, uh, you know, hotel after sleazy hotel after sleazy hotel. And you've got to really want that life to, uh, yeah, to do. Absolutely. So, um, I had to make the, the choice. And what years, it. what years is this roughly? Uh, that's, this would be from 2004 to, I think my last like official stand up routine that I did, um, was my farewell, what I called my farewell show. That was in 2011. Okay. So, so this is just a this is just a curiosity question. So you've been in New York City then? I was just curious out for my own curiosity. Have you been in New York and do you like it? I do. Not necessarily as a comedy. I've been twice. Um I uh I think the 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 comedy there is uh it's more raw and see everybody has their own I guess style and the, the audience that they're, they're trying to connect to. Obviously, with my accent, I can't blend in in New York. You know what I'm saying? So there, there are certain right. stories that are regional that you know people in the South will get me because I talk a lot about the stereotypes that go along with, with being in the South. Um, I loved New York City as a whole. Um, it just the comedy and me didn't really mesh well. And that's because, yeah, of, everyone... that's because of the accent, you know? Right. Everyone's like, hey, Joe, hey, listen to this freaking guy. <laughs> you get it? Forget about it. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that they didn't have, they've never, they act like they've never heard of sweet tea. I just think that's a tragedy. I mean, an absolute. I tragedy. don't think that's an act. I, I, I've never heard of it either until, you, until it just came out of your mouth. I've never heard the words, never heard that's of it. Sweet tea. I, I bet you there's a lot. Uh, I don't think I was lying. I'm pretty sure I wasn't. So you didn't try to move out. You you never got in your mind though to like move to California or New York and try and make it as a comedian. No, uh, I, uh, to me, it was more of a, a hobby that I took more serious than a, a standard hobby. I never had any dreams of like, or grandiose dreams that I was going to be some big time comedian. For me, it was more about the writing. The, uh, there, there, there was something about sitting down, I had a ritual where I would sit down every night and I would just write whatever was in my head. It didn't matter if it was funny, if it was, um, you know, not funny, whatever was in my head, I would put down on paper. And then I would go back and a couple weeks later, read what I wrote that particular night and pull from that uh, what became my jokes. And there was something, you know, cathartic about sitting down and just writing out in a stream of consciousness. So for me, it was more like a therapy, I guess. It's a good. It's a good place to rant, especially. Like right. Now. Yeah. Well. Yeah. That's probably like. I mean, I don't know if you know Roseanne's original story, but she was like a housewife living in a trailer park, and she used to just same thing you just said. Late at night, she'd start writing just to keep her sanity, and you know, one thing led to another, and she started an act. I was going to ask you, uh, Richard Pryor. Have you ever seen Richard Pryor? Have I ever seen Richard Pryor? Yes, absolutely. It's the best, right? Well, I don't know. I don't know, but you know how many. If people still, I'm, I'm sure you being into comedy, you might. You probably still watch like George Carlin, Richard Pryor. But yes. you know, I don't know necessarily if if I say that just out on Twitter randomly, nobody would nobody would say, "Oh yeah, he's my favorite." You know, oh, someone no. like John Stewart would tell you he's his favorite comedian. But the, the the generation that's coming below us are um, we can get into that later. But they're ignorant, uh, ignorant idiots. I don't want to say that out loud. Did I say that out loud, Kyle? I didn't mean to say that out loud. Idiots. Ignorant they're, idiots. Um, it, it's uh, when you when I think of comedy, uh, the first person that, that comes to my mind is George Carlin. I, to me, there is not a better, more um, just his cadence and his ability to write not only funny. You know, let's take the funny aside. His style is unmatched still to this day. Yeah, he's brilliant. Hold a candle to a George Carlin. Bill Hicks, of course. Um, Jim Gaffigan, I think, is dead on. 
Uh, it, it's hard. The, the hardest thing for a comedian to do is work clean. Uh, most comedians that are, you know, out on circuit, they're what they call blue comedians, or they, you know, they tell the the dirty jokes and uh, they cuss, and it's that's just an easy way to get a giggle out of an audience. But to me, a true like craftsman of the trade, I think, is somebody like Jim Gaffigan, who's able to be hilarious without going to that area. You know, to me, Jim that's Gaffigan. Jim Gaffigan and Bill Hicks, I don't actually know. Um, Richard Pryor, when I when I was in seventh grade or eighth grade, we all got together and watched. I think it was live on the Sunset Strip, and I was like totally blown away. I mean, I memorized that whole. That was the years when Eddie Murphy too was was on the oh. scene and starting to become really famous. And the Very first pleasant. his first two, what? Oh, my bad. I didn't mean to interrupt you there. The first two Eddie Murphy movies I thought were off the charts. Brilliant. That's uh, 48 Hours and Trading Places. Mm -hmm. um, no, Bill Hicks, I don't know. And the other guy you mentioned, I don't know. If you want to see a uh, somebody, I guess if I had to choose somebody that would come close to, you know, George Carlin had a, uh, there was a depth to his jokes. It wasn't just about the, the laughs. He had a message and a you know, a uh, he wanted to convey a an idea. The right. best orator of ideas in the in the comedy world, I think, is Bill Hicks. He he had a way of exposing the not only the, the lunacy but the just how people can be so absolutely absurd sometimes. And when you left or when you got done watching one of his uh, stand up routines, you could conquer the world. Like that's how motivating he was he would spend the first half of his comedy routine breaking down where society kind of breaks down and then the the latter half building you up as an individual but in a way that was just i mean it's un, it's unparalleled the guy was a genius cool so i will check him out well what about um the other person this is gonna this is quasi controversial it's too bad but the other guy who i thought was super talented who i watched almost everything was uh louis ck yeah, uh, there's nothing. Uh, there's nothing. I don't think controversial about that. I, you could say the same thing about uh, Bill Cosby. Uh, people. Oh yeah, it, for sure. I forgot about that. <laughs> he just went to jail. Uh, as a matter of fact, you have to be able to separate the the two. You know, they they were not the same. The person that, as a kid, I fell in love with watching him on on TV, um, is not who he is now. Uh, who he is now is a is a monster and. Um, disgusting but it doesn't take away i don't think what he was able to do back then on that stage because for all the bad that he did and he did some bad i mean unforgivable things here um in those moments where he was on that stage and he was you know telling those jokes who knows the amount of good that he was doing in that particular moment. And you can't take that away, not from him, but from the people that felt that. Like, um, you know, screw him. Uh, there's, this has nothing to do with him being a good person, but it has to do with the connection or what he was able to kind of inspire in other people. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes total sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't necessarily think that what someone's personal life has to detract from the from the art that they produced it's just in terms of conversation about him you know you gotta you gotta tiptoe around it in today's today's culture because you i don't know it's just how things are you know it's just how Same people spaces. are wired nowadays <laughs> uh, well yeah with, exactly um, <laughs> like he like i said he is a he's a monster and I, to be honest i can't watch him the same today uh i couldn't sit down and watch Bill Cosby and laugh knowing what I know now. However, I remember rolling back in the day to him because he was hilarious then. And that's a, that's a different Bill Cosby though. That's, that's not who he is now. And um, now he's just, it's sad. Right. I mean, it's really sad that people do that to themselves. Well, with, with Louis CK, for example, there's a, um, there was a bit he used to do that was actually memorable where he's he's talking about himself watching the female news reporter on TV getting all riled up going like say Lib say Libya say Libya 
Libya, Libya, say it again. And like watching it now, you're like, oh, snap, that's a little too close to home yeah. there, pal. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's a little it's, scary. It's, it is, it's a sad thing. I don't, I don't understand, uh, you know, like you can never, you never can tell with people. I don't have that impulse that, you know, wants to drug women to, uh, to sleep with them or, you know, do just disgusting acts in front of them. Um, so, I'm not in either one of their their heads, but to me, when you have that kind of command of people, because Louis C.K. could have been huge. I mean, like he could have been a legend. And to yeah, all absolutely. Like, for what? I mean, like now look at what he is. He's a he's a joke. You know, he, instead of his jokes becoming legendary, he's now going to be a legend for being a, just a joke. And that's sad. Yeah, that is sad. Okay, so let's go. Let's go to the the heart of the matter. Um, you became an atheist somewhere down the line. Now you started out a Christian, right? Did I? I became an atheist. You? I think you. I think you did. Did you not? Well, maybe you didn't. Um, maybe well, you're I'm still maybe. working on. You like. No, you like right. Steve. You're, you're still right. working it out. Oh, you did. Right. Okay. I just checked my calendar. You're right. I did. So what happened? One day you're like, what? Nice young Christian man. Apparently a little overweight. Um, yeah. Tell me, tell me, uh, tell me where it all began, Kyle. Where, actually, where did you go? Where did you start going wrong, and why? That's actually wh why I became an atheist because I prayed for so long for God to make me skinny, and it finally just took the devil to do it. And um, I said, you know what? Devil all the way now. I how did the devil help you? Crack cocaine? Okay. <laughs> devil, what did Absolutely the... cocaine. <laughs> no, I used to. Did you? Um, really... I, I was. Uh, I was probably at my heaviest. Uh, two, eighty-two, I believe. That's the that's the heaviest I remember. And what it was from was because I went in uh, in high school. I played football and I wrestled. Okay. And then when I got to college, uh, I, I wanted to join a fraternity. And so I spent every night, you know, at a fraternity and all of that beer and the, the food that you would get because at, you know, 2.30 in the morning cookout was just the greatest thing on the planet. Uh, those of you living in the South will know exactly what I mean when I say cookout. Um, their milkshakes are incredible. And so that, that packed on the pounds. And uh, before I knew it, I, I, the, the turning point for me was when I was walking, I had a, a dorm room up on the third floor of our, uh, our dorm. And uh, it was after class, it was like six o'clock in the afternoon. And it was, uh, it was in September, so it was hot. And walking up the steps, and I got halfway up there and I could not move. Like, I literally couldn't take another step and I couldn't catch my breath. And so I went to the uh, emergency room and wow. I had... I had in the course of me just being at college for two years, gained so much weight so quickly that it had developed a form of asthma in me. There was so much like pressure on my lungs that it wasn't used to for all of those years. So you introduce all of this um, weight very quickly and your lungs don't have time to kind of adjust with it. So I was now using an inhaler. Every time I would walk upstairs, inhaler. Every time I would walk uh, too far across the campus, inhaler. It was just pathetic. And I woke up one morning and I, was, and I was like, I am not using that damn inhaler for the rest of my life. It's just not going to happen. And so I, for the next two years, spent uh, trying every diet thing you can imagine. I tried the... <laughs> I tried the Weight Watchers. I tried Atkins. I, you know, anything in the grocery store that had low fat and low carb. Uh, every men's health magazine that came out, uh, I was doing it all, and nothing was working. Nothing. Wow. I would lose, so what? I would lose some weight so and uh, get on the scale, and then the next week it would be right back again. So, what worked? Well, yeah. What finally did it? I mean, you, you don't struggle with it now, it doesn't seem like, uh, right? A uh, prayer. No. <laughs> I'm kidding. No. Um, I, I, you're not, you're not going I'm not, to. I'm not that dumb. I'm pretty slow on the uptake, Kyle, but I'm not quite that dumb. I, uh, prayer. What, what a Weisenheimer. Well, busting my chops. All right, go ahead. The simple, the simple solution for uh, when I did this, what I'm about to tell you, the weight shed off. 
I mean, what? every day, every week, it was just coming off like nothing. And that is, I cut sugar completely out of my diet. I would eat all of the meat that I wanted. Um, I didn't, I didn't starve myself on anything that was like cheeses and um, uh, steaks, uh, chicken, fish. I would eat as much as I wanted in a day. And by me cutting out sugar, no drinks, no uh, like white breads, nothing with uh, that simple carbohydrate that breaks simple down carbs, carbs right, right, shoots your um, shoots your blood sugar up. It shed off. And uh, that's how I am today. I, um, I, I do deviate from my sugar now because um, I'm older and now I just don't, I just don't give a damn anymore. <laughs> I'm not quite as, uh, you know, in college, you, you have to be a little bit more conscious because you're constantly surrounded by uh, beautiful people. Right. But, um, now I'm just surrounded by flat earthers. So it's, there's not too many people to impress. So there's no reason. There's no reason to stay beautiful. But what about your fans, Kyle? I'm kidding. And uh, as I, as for you people listening, you hear that? If you chubbalubs out there, just cut the sugar out, and you're good to go. Is that that's a good word, right, Kyle? It works. Hey, um, it, it's amazing. But it, it's uh, if you just cut out the drinks that you drink, just try that, and you cannot do the the uh, the sugar substitutes either. It's actually even worse than regular sugar because the number one, it's, it's made with chemicals. Number two, it still has the same effects on your um, glucose as regular sugar. So just drink water. I know it sucks. It's uh, it's very plain and uh, you know just there's not there's not a lot of glamour to it. But if you want to lose weight, start there and you will see the progress, and that progress will inspire you to start cutting out more things. And once you see that weight start to come off that's all you're going to need i promise you and you get that feeling and um it's just a, it's a it's a good thing and, and it's, it's better for your overall health so just cut it out okay so now tell me about the background you're you're the family that you grew up in is christian correct and you were raised oh, yeah. strong christian like were you raised intensely christian when you were in like high school and grade school i i was very intensely um Christian and it's my entire family is uh, very 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 hardcore Christian um, I've actually got three pastors in my uh, in my family um, three of my cousins are pastors um, my my one of my cousins husband is um, a deacon and uh, preaches and we actually work out together and so it's it's very funny now um, he he listens to the show and so we often have kind of spin off debates while we're working out and um it, it's a good dynamic that, that that we have that we're able to do that you know he doesn't treat so he's cool he's he's cool with he's cool with your stance yeah and well, in general that, yeah i don't know that he's cool like he's not he's not cool with it but he respects it you know what i'm saying and that's a big difference like you don't have to be and you're not supposed to be as a christian you know that's that's what the uh, the the Bible tells you. You're supposed to go out and uh, preach the good word. Preach the preach the gospel. Right. So yeah, go out into a, all the world. Be offended if he um, if he didn't try because uh, that would mean he 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 didn't want me to uh, spin a turkey. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't care. He didn't give he didn't right. care less. Yeah. Um, I don't hold that now. But I, he respects it. He doesn't try to like demean or. Um, treat me any differently because I don't believe the same thing that he does. And I think that's an important takeaway that some Christians could really learn from, you know, that you don't have to like it, but you should respect it. Now, when you grew up, is that is, I don't actually know this. Is that considered the heart of the Bible belt or is it yes. a really religious community? Yeah, it is considered. Okay. So, so what's that experience like? Tell me about that. Um, oh, well, I, you you were Christian in high school, right? And you were like a practicing Christian. You go to church on Sunday. You, yes, uh, and actually, you didn't drink. You didn't smoke that type of stuff, or I or no? To, I didn't drink. To, I didn't drink anything until I went to to college. And um, I my in like up until my sophomore year in high school, my my dad, my brother, my mom, we would all go to church on. Sunday, Sunday night, Wednesday, any kind of church functions. And 
uh, meet up with the rest of my family because we all went to the same church. And okay. um, in uh, my sophomore year in high school, uh, I didn't feel like I was getting enough from the church that I was going to. It was a smaller church. I had went to uh, my friend Ben, who is who actually is a minister down in the, uh, the southern part of North Carolina now. He's my best friend in high school, but his church had a like a rocking youth group, and um, I just enjoyed myself there. So I actually okay. broke away from my family's church and started going to his church. I joined his church because I felt like I was getting more out of it. And um, I actually got me and him, what we would do, we got to where we would uh, run youth night, which was Sunday nights. You know, the every the if you're in the youth, the high school youth groups, we would go in the fellowship hall and um, we actually got to run those. We made things like um, we spent a week probably before this actually happened, making a game called Who Wants to Be a Bible Heir? And we uh, set up podiums and, um, you know, it was just like Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, but with uh, Bible questions. And so those were some of the things that I would spend my afternoons doing, uh, making either, um, you know, mock lessons or games like that to do for, for the youth night. So I was heavily immersed in the Bible church culture. What, what type of, what denomination was that? It was, if you know, uh, it was, it was a Southern Baptist. Now my, my family goes to a, an independent Baptist. So I went from an independent to a Southern and the difference between the two, if you're wondering is if you've ever looked at a Southern Baptist and said, um, I like it, but I need something um, more to the right, more conservative, more authoritarian than an independent Baptist is exactly what you're looking for. The one that your family is is a more hardcore, more conservative. Correct. And the and so, wow, because Southern Baptist is famously like the hardcore conservative oh, it, sect listen, of Christianity, right? There are two. There are two farther degrees right than um, the Southern Baptist. So you have the Southern Baptist, you have Independent Baptist, and then to the extreme far right is the Primitive Baptist. And anything with the word primitive in the uh, in the name of your denomination, you know it's going to be like the old times. You know, like <laughs> they call themselves primitive. They wear that with a, that moniker with a badge of honor. So, so your family of origin is uh, where are they at now? Are they like your brother is gay, right or no? Yes. Do I have that right? And he lives in West Hollywood. Absolutely. We both are actually. That's that's the interesting part. Both are you both gay? Now right. you okay? So so how did did you know you were gay then, or were you yes. were you kind of aware of it? And what what I, was happening? Was it a struggle? I was I was aware of it. It was a it was probably the hardest thing that I've ever. Um, it's the hardest thing that I've ever had to go through. And I wouldn't wish it on anyone. And um, it uh, this will make sense in a little bit, but. The sh the looking back the the pressure and the uh, judgment that I felt because of being from a such a strict uh, Christian sect, uh, right, caused so many things that would later come. That that's why I have the attitude and why I do what I do now. Like I don't have an issue just to put it out there, like, like you, like the, the kind of Christian that, that you are, if there were more like you or if all of, if all of Christians were like you, you wouldn't have an issue with the atheist versus uh, Christian thing. The, you know, the, the constant back and forth, there wouldn't be a problem. Right. The problem yeah. I, I kind of get that. Yeah. The problem comes in, especially with me when people take the, the, the book and they try to apply it to other people's lives, other people that don't want it and it's harmful. And I'll just explain why I say that, that it's harmful. I struggled with that, that, that on the inside. Now, as a Christian um, guy who was gay, obviously I could not tell anyone that that would just be, um, you know, that would be earth shattering. That would, uproot everything within my you know my family it would uh splinter my friends uh, no one in the church would look at me the same um 
that's just something that I couldn't do. So every day I'd wake up, get dressed for school. Uh, but I've had to put on something extra that most people didn't in the morning, and that would be a mask. I would have to be someone else. I would have to um, – the mannerisms, the uh, the interest in girls that I really didn't have any interest in. But you just have to portray that so that people don't ask any questions. It, it, it's tiring, and it's exhausting, and it, um, it takes a lot out of you mentally. And um, I remember – uh, in college, I met a girl, and uh, she was a lot of fun. There wasn't anything, like, romantic because I didn't feel that for for girls. But if I had to choose someone to spend the rest of my life with pretending, she would be the one. Um, okay. She was just a lot of fun. And so I asked her to marry me. And there were so many nights. Wow. Yeah, wow. I was engaged. Were you was were you were you sexual with her and everything was like yeah. in order as far as you were concerned? Yeah. And what I, were you I, doing? I mean, Fantasizing about like Schwarzenegger or something? <laughs> it just wasn't an issue. I mean, uh, how did that, how did that go I down? Was it... can, I don't have crude you can get on on your channel, but I mean, even even gay people like boobs, Craig. That's just um, that's just a that's just goes without saying. Um, but, okay. Uh, I. I, I was, we were sexual. Um, there were now, there were a lot of times where I spent a lot of time making excuses. Like, you know, I'm tired from work and it was wow, like okay. a, you know, it was a very, it was a very far and few between um, thing. It was a, it was a horrible thing. Uh, like looking back, the relationship was just. Did she know? There, Did she have any inclining when you told her? Was she kind of like, no. ah, or was she no. like. She had no, she had no clue. And I'll tell you how we, how we broke up here in just a second, but let me, um, let me get back a little bit to the, um, the, just what it does to you part. I remember okay. several nights laying in the bed, uh, with her right next to me, looking up at the ceiling and in our ceiling, it's got the, like the stucco ceilings where it looks like popcorn all up on top of your, you know, your ceiling. And right. I stared and I, repeated this so many times that I could tell you in a square a certain amount, you know, a certain uh, inches from the uh, the other wall, how many pieces of that stucco was there because I had spent so much time looking up and counting and just staring while I said this very thing. I would literally be praying, begging actually is a more appropriate word, for God to see that I was trying that I didn't want to be this way, that I'm trying to do everything that he wants me to do. I'm trying to do everything that he's asking me to do. I, I, maybe if I get married, maybe if I have the kids, maybe if I, you know, buckle down more in the church, that will be an indicator that I'm serious about wanting to change who I am and that he'll take it away. And I remember like so many nights just, begging for him to take that away like I, I didn't want to be that I did not want to be gay it, it's not something that I was um hiding because you know secretly I, I really did enjoy I didn't I hated every single minute of it and no matter what I could not get that feeling to go away and I, she actually went down to a uh, a Zach Brown band concert and I think this is probably stems off of <laughs> our lack of uh, intimacy as it should have been. But she went up going down there and hooking up with another guy that was at the concert. And um, I found out about it. And it was a month before we were supposed to get married in October. And oh, okay. We had everything bought, you know, purchased, paid for, the reception, all of that, the cake, all of that was already you know, purchased and all that. And I used that as my way out. I used that as I can't get past that. And it was a, probably a year later that she finally found out that I was gay. But a uh, cool, kind of a cool looking back twist to the story. The guy that she cheated on me with, she's actually married with two kids, happily married. And um, so it worked out for her. And uh, it worked out like it should have for her. Wow. So the, so the 
Okay, go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna um, I was just gonna say after that, I woke up one morning. It was a Saturday morning, and something was different. And I can't to this day put my finger on what it was, but I just remember thinking, I'm not doing it anymore. I am not suffering another day. I'm not going to hide who I am anymore. And like it was a, it was like a, an avalanche of things because it, it was not too many weeks later that I was in a youth group at church and we were closing down and a couple of the guys were watching a, a video on YouTube and just beside themselves, just absolutely beside themselves. And I walked over and w- looking and it, uh, it was the episode of Matt Dillahunty and Aaron Ross. I was just going to say Matt Dillahunty. Oh my God. That's crazy. Yeah. All right, it go was on. Actually, actually Aaron Ra was the, and I'll, and I'll get to that in a second, but it was Aaron Ra that, um, that I owe everything that, you know, my, that spoke my to you, that spoke to, to you in that, that, that moment. Not only that moment, but more, and that's why it's, uh, you know, I, I get accused of being a, uh, you know, an Arn Raw cheerleader. Fanatic? I, I am. I am. I, I am. He, he woke, in my opinion, he woke me up to where I can, like, feel free and who I am. Because uh, it was the slavery thing. They were talking about slavery. And I remember watching that video with those other two guys in the fellowship hall and saying, that's not in the Bible. He is making that up. It is nowhere in the Bible that uh, he condoned slavery. And Matt spouted out at, he spouted out a um, a verse. And I remember I wrote it down and I went home. And I right before I went to bed, I put out my Bible and I went to that verse, and it was there. And I remembered like that sinking feeling, like no, 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 no. Why did we not ever learn about this? Like why is this the first time I'm hearing about that? And so I pulled that video back up and I began to watch. Every afternoon when I'd get back from school, their videos, I mean, just obsessively watching, checking as they went along. The verses were there. Yep, it said that. And then Aaron Ra did a, um, a speech, and um, I forget what state it was in, but it was like he was talking to me. And he started out talking about the, the harm that certain religious people can do on people who are gay and to make them feel this way. But it was just like he was talking to me like there was no audience there it was Arn Ra was in my living room and he was telling me that you don't have to be that way anymore like you can be who you are you can be free you can uh, live your life and that's okay you know there doesn't have to be anything more than that that needs to be piled on top and it was like a weight was lifted off of my my chest and that was the uh, that was the last time I ever gave any type of God, a thought, a serious. How thought. old were you at this point? How old were you? I was 25. What age is this? 25. Because you said school. You were still in college at this point? I had taken. You came back from school. Uh, no, in, when, I, when I went to uh, become a, a chef, I was taking some culinary classes. You know, you, you, you take a couple every couple of years to you know, kind of brush up on things. It wasn't I was in college. It was a, um, like an auxiliary course. But, um, yeah, I was 25 years old. Because you're friends with him now, right? Uh, as far as I can tell, you're friends with Aaron Ra, correct? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's what, what um, about Matt? Are you friends with Matt Dillahunty a little bit or I, no? Uh, I, I, I talk to Matt Dillahunty every now and then. Um, I don't know that, you know, he's not – he doesn't have the relationship that me and, that me and Arne do. Me and Arne talk, you know – Sometimes right, he comes on the show a lot, and he did a right. bunch of stuff with Ken Hoven. He's kind of like a he's – a, he's a little bit higher up the food chain than some of the regulars, but he's kind of a regular, right? As far as yeah, I can tell, he seems – He is, and that's um, So that's, that's pretty amazing. Um, so like what – how, how – yeah, but you get to actually start – it'd be like – it'd be like if I started hanging out with, like, Robert De Niro. You know, I started taking yeah. like, and then Robert De Niro would come over and we'd get coffee. It's like the thing you fantasize about. I mean, I guess you were 25, but it's like the thing I fantasized about when I was like 15 with like, but I was Joe Strummer and like Robert De Niro and, well, you, you know. You have to think about this too. You have to think about this. Um, with uh, 
there's a little bit of a uh, actually there's a lot of a difference like i understand what you're saying absolutely and there are so many celebrities that i would love channing tatum of course would be my number one but this is somebody that is responsible for uh, essentially freeing you from the prison you put yourself in like the the amount of stress and the exhaustion and the you know going through the routines of you know, hiding who you are takes such a toll on you and to be able to bring that person that kind of woke you up from that onto a show that you do you know he's coming on to a show that you're doing is just incredible so i mean like it, the guy's amazing i had i had 40 subscribers the, when i first messaged him and uh, it was it was the first week we had started doing the show. And I said, you know what? I'm going to send him a message and let him know that, um, number one, to thank him for what he did. And number two, to let him know that I know I'm a, you know, I'm a nobody with 40 subscribers, but I would love to talk to him sometime if he would, if he had the time. And you, it was five minutes for me sending that message to him sending me a message back that just said, give me a time, I'll be there. That was it. Cool. I mean, the he had there was no kind of. He's just a he's a down to earth guy, you know. He he there's he doesn't have a, a false sense of self. He um, he knows that or he, the the things he talks about he knows and he wants to get them out there and but that's not me being free from that point is just the the real tip of the iceberg there because what happened to me after that initial uh, coming out is what led me to spend a year in prison. Because, oh, wow. Okay. Right. Be because, what what um, age? Keep me, keep me on the age 25. Cause I like to sure. get a sense. Um, sure. 25, 26, was, right? Right. 25, 26. I was 20. Uh, I was 27 getting ready to turn 28 when I went to uh, finally went to prison. And for the two years prior to that, what happened was once I came out, once I said the words, I'm gay and I'm atheist, okay, I stopped mm -hmm. being the, the, the Kyle that I had known all of my life. That Kyle was gone. Uh, there, that, that Kyle that, I, that had been with me for 25 years was poof vanished. And what about like, your family? Did how did they see you? Did were you different to them? Was it like a different person? Or? I was. I was fortunate. Um, it's very strange, but I was. I'm one of those rare people uh, that. I was very fortunate that I didn't lose anyone. Um, in fact, I, I I got a lot more support than um, I ever thought that I would. I, I did. Nobody shunned me. Nobody treated me any differently. It's not something that we talk about, you know, it's uh, when we have, when we do Christmas or those things, everybody knows, but we just don't mention it. We don't make it a, an issue. Thankfully, I have a family that put me first and knows who I am, you know, as a person right? and isn't willing to lose that. And for that, I give them, you know... Uh, it's, well, I would think that's a, I mean, you, you, you say that and I, I totally hear you, but I would think that that's a pretty, like a normal, the, the responses where people say like their family disowned them because of X, Y, Z. I can't even mean, imagine that. I know, but I can't mean. even imagine that. My, my mother would never disown me no matter what. If I said I killed six people, she'd be like, oh dear, let's talk about it. You know, she just nothing. Well, that's, There's nothing that's I could do. Sure, exactly. That's, be, that's exactly, that's normal that, to me. That's not the norm, uh, unfortunately. I mean, you're right; it should be, but it's not. So I didn't have to 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 go through that. My struggle, and I, I don't think that I would have made it out of that. Honestly, I think that if that had been the case, if I'd have, you know, if my family had have uh, shunned you, left me, uh, I wouldn't. I, I would be dead, definitely. Um, the uh, either by you know by my own hands or the the drugs. What one of those two would have definitely taken me and that's not lost on me one bit but uh i couldn't deal with the adjustment of being the real me because 
everything that I had been, everything that I, that I was, was rooted in the, the Christian straight Kyle. And he's gone. So I couldn't deal. And I turned to, um, it started out, I turned to uh, drinking, to weed, which led to uh, cocaine and a really nasty cocaine habit. I mean, really bad cocaine habit. And it, because it made, it got me to where I didn't think about it. I didn't care. I was, uh, you know, I was existing and that was fine with me. I didn't have those, those thoughts that uh, were depressing or you know, made me angry. It just took me to another place. I would clean, <laughs> you know, because anybody that's, that's done cocaine knows what I mean. Like you, you get on, uh, you get on a mission and you're focused on that mission and nothing else matters. Nothing else in the world matters. And I like that. And that was it just snorting, snorting Coke? And how were you yeah. paying for it? Were you, did you start dealing? Because uh, it's I, expensive. It, it is. Um, I, that's what I, I did. That's eventually what led to me um, spending time in, in um, prison. Thankfully, I pled down to a, since it was my first, you know, my first thing, I pled down. So they didn't pop me with that. But, uh, but yes, you, you get in that world and eventually the, uh, your habit is uh, more sub <laughs> more abundant than your um, your funds. You have way more habit than you do money to pay for it. And I got sent to News Correctional Institution for a year, and it changed my life. I actually it was it's a weird thing, man. I wouldn't take back going to prison for anything. And that sounds strange, and uh, it doesn't sound normal, but I learned how to be okay with me there in an environment that stereotypically you would think would be – well, it depends on what side of the coin you're on. Right before I went to prison, um, a couple of my, my really good friends said, oh, well, this is going to be like heaven for you, right? A, a gay guy going to prison. Oh, okay, so guy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, also you get the, st the there's a stereotype that, that, that gay people get, you know, all they're going to do is get beat up and, um, none, of that could be from the truth. none of that could be farther from the truth. I, uh, I actually had several people that I was in prison with, uh, once we were out and, uh, you know, so I keep, I keep in contact with, with some of them. Uh, a couple of them have said that the reason that, I didn't never get, I never got messed with. I never got, um, you know, nobody ever harassed me. Nobody tried anything on me. Um, and they said it was because from day one, I came in with that attitude of, um, this is who I am. If you don't like me, then, um, you know, too bad. And right. that's how I am now. And I wouldn't have been there. I wouldn't have gotten that if I didn't go to, uh, to prison, but I left that, I left that place a lot better than, I came in and uh, it's just a, a, a series of unfortunate and fortunate events that lead me here now talking to you about the whole entire experience. So you, you, you turn into an atheist and then you, the atheism frees you up to accept your gayness. Is that kind of how it went down? But then at the same time, you start getting heavily into drugs. Right. Um, yes. And then going to prison is kind of like not necessarily a wake up call, but how would you how would you say it? And oh, it kind of oh, sounds like like a wake up call, like a, a you yeah, know, sure. um, wake up call would be. Uh, it, it, it was a it was a combination of things. It was the uh, the shock of the environment, because to this day I'll never forget. I'll never get the sound that that gate made when it or that you know that cell gate first made with that first night when it clinked shut i mean that was just like so yeah shocking. i can imagine um so i'll never get that because you were sentenced to what you were sentenced to a year when that happened or two yeah. years or what i was sentenced i was sentenced to um to 24 months uh good behavior uh you know all that stuff you you work your time down so for every like when you go and you work for 10 hours a day every day you right. get like so many hours off of your your sentence. So you, I worked it down to where it, it wound up being a year. 
And um, it was a wake up call, but it was also the the duration. Like if I'd have if I would have just spent, uh, you know, even four weeks, let's say, in jail or prison, uh, I would have gotten out and went straight back into what I was doing. But the fact that I had to get used to me, me, me for a year, and I had time to really sit and think, because there are moments um, in prison where that's all you can do. You can't do anything. You're you're stuck in a location for set duration of time and you cannot leave even if you wanted to like you just cannot move from that so you're forced to sit there and be with yourself and think and over the course of that year that's what i needed i needed to be able to sit down with my own thoughts hash out who i was and you know the way that the you know my worldview was now and that length of time allowed me to get everything that I needed lined up, and then that gate opened, and I haven't looked back since. Okay, let me uh, let me put. Can I pause this somehow? Because my wife is trying to reach me, and she tried sure. three times. Okay, hold on. I'll be back in a sec. All right, back. You there? Cool. Yeah. Um. Yeah, actually, I I know a lot. I know a lot of the story personally. I've only I only spent one night in jail. Um, but the drugs. Did you do recovery when you were, or was the year in prison enough to just not? <laughs> that counted as my recovery. Um, I I I I don't think that this is just my my personal opinion. And mm -hmm. it may even only apply to me, but therapy wouldn't have worked for me either. It was something that I had to get straight with myself, you know, and some right. people, some people need the, the you know, the, the other person to talk to. For me, if I'd have done that, honestly, if I went to therapy, it would just probably be me sitting there lying to or trying to diminish the totality of the situation with somebody I didn't know with me having to, you know, be along with my thoughts that really forced me to go through them all. And that's what I needed. So it, it's different for everybody, but it just happened to work for me. Right. So you never joined like NA or AA or anything like that? No. Uh -uh. Okay. Cause I was in that for a while. I was actually in rehab twice. Yeah. Um, second mean, time it, was it definitely worked for some people. Some people. Well, it didn't fully work for me until I became a Christian. Then, then I then I was fine in like two thousand one. But um, so you you get out. What's that? I was just going to ask. What do you um, what would you say if I said that maybe Christianity became your new addiction? How would you um, respond? It it's I can see why somebody would think that, but it was more of. It's very similar to what you're describing. Uh, I was at war with myself, not necessarily because of any, um, but I was at war with myself. And then when I became a Christian, that war ceased. I, was, I started to have peace of mind. And when I had peace of mind, I didn't really need to drink anymore. Um, and drugs was, the fur drugs was like the furthest thing from my mind. Like, um, I would probably still, I shouldn't say this, but I would probably still smoke a joint every now and again. But uh, <laughs> you didn't hear me say that, and I'm saying there's that live. Wrong with that, though. Like, there's, there's nothing wrong with I, that. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but weed I'm, is not a, it's not something. Talk about weed is a drug at all. Um, weed does so many, it has so many, so many more benefits than, um, than it does negatives. And if, if somebody gets, you can't, uh, <laughs> number one, if you uh, smoke too much weed, you pass out with a bag of Funyuns in your, your lap. And if you drive while you're high, you just go too slow. And uh, that's a statistical thing, actually. I <laughs> I said that as a joke, just joking when um, we did a weed we debate on my channel between Frankie from the, uh, the Geek Room. Yes, and, and SJ. Stephanie and, was uh, on that, wasn't she? Yeah, but she actually went and looked it up. And uh, she actually confirmed that I was, uh, I was right, that statistics shows that people actually – 
drive way too slow when they're high. Like that's the uh, it's backed up by statistics. So I thought that was pretty <laughs> there you go. The thing with weed, I was actually I was actually more or less done with weed by the time I was in college because I stopped. We smoked so much in high school that I stopped enjoying it. If you if you do it for too much and too long, it starts to just make you paranoid, and it's a very actually unpleasant feeling. Um, it started to make me like I started to really not like it, so I just stopped doing it. And you know, every once in a while, out of for old times' sake. Um, but for, and to answer your original question, um, peace of mind. Once I started to have peace of mind, and uh, part of it's the age thing nowadays. Like I, I would never want to be hungover anymore. I used to get vicious hangovers. Um, but the, uh, I, you know, it's not that dissimilar from what you talked about. You start to feel more at peace in your own skin, and you're not at war with yourself, and you just don't feel the need to kill off the thing inside of you that is plaguing you so to speak that the drugs are trying to do away with that's how i heard your story i don't know if that's how you intended it but you you kind of faced yourself you had a year to stare in the mirror and you kind of worked something out right your 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 biggest competition and the uh, the most difficult thing to conquer in your life is yourself the moment that right. you're able to realize that if you feel like you're locked in a, a prison, it's one that you built for yourself and that you have the keys in your pocket the entire time. It's just, are you willing to reach into your pocket, take those keys and let yourself out? Some people aren't. Some people um, get way too comfortable inside of that, uh, that prison. And if, if religion gives you a peace of mind, I think that's great. My uh, my grandmother is the shining example of what a, what a, a Christian should strive to to be. Uh, she follows that book uh, to a T. I mean, to the letter. And right. uh, there's a finer Christian woman alive, and I would right. never, in a in never ever take that away from her. But she also doesn't try to. Uh, make religion that special to other people. You know what I mean? Like she, it, it's her thing, and she uh, she enjoys it for herself. Where I where I take great offense is the notion that other people can take it and then try to apply it to other people's lives. Because if they knew or if they could feel for a day what I felt for twenty five years. They'd never try it again. I guarantee you that it would never happen. Well, when you were when you were struggling in your uh, well, first let's go to let's 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 go further with the biography. Um, so you get out of prison, and you start becoming more of a public atheist. Is is that part of what your the thing that you just described, like? It's kind of part of your mission, isn't it? You want to give that to somebody else in terms of how you felt. This is what I hear. You tell me if I'm hearing this correctly. That for you, sure. becoming an atheist was, and I, I imagine this is true of a lot of people that I've talked to, there was a sense of liberation there. There's a sense of I no longer have to fight to, to keep myself in a box that I, I don't fit in. And I feel free now that I don't have to believe this and I can be, especially with the gay, I can be who I am. Is that fair to say? Is that's what I heard? Is that true? That would be accurate. I would, I would think that would be accurate. So now you start becoming more of a public, I, I don't know if we're there yet. Are we, are we in your public, public ministry? I'm about to say your public ministry, Kyle, did we get to your public ministry yes. yet? Uh, we, we are at the, the Reverend Kyle Curtis's, um, yeah. See, it has a nice ring to it. You say it's sarcastic, but it just sounds so right, Kyle. Oh, it come does. on. It does. Um, no, uh, I I do this, and I and I I became I got into this by accident, actually. To be honest with you, a complete accident. I had no in, no desire whatsoever to be a, a YouTuber. None. Uh, a year ago, around this time, actually, this was around the time that all of this started. It was a year ago. I was watching a Christopher Hitchens debate and it was on autoplay. 
And I walked out of the room and it had went to the next video. And the next video was a debate video that Steve was hosting. And Steve McCray. Uh, I was right. And I was listening and it was uh, it was between uh, I think Red's rhetoric and, and G Man, but I remember I was like, Oh wow, there's a there's like amateurs that do this on YouTube. I had no clue. So I started really watching them and I just had this idea pop in my head and I said, you know what? I bet it'd be really cool to kind of do what we're doing right now. I wanted to do like a, I wanted to get a couple, get in touch with a couple of them, uh, record a interview with them and do kind of like a, like VH1 used to do behind the music, but with the debaters just to see um, what led them to the side that they were on. And um, do that. I wanted to do a four, like a four episode podcast. That was it. I just want to do a really simple podcast, upload it to iTunes and be done. It was a side project. That was it. I had, I didn't even spend a lot of time thinking about it. And um, I contacted Steve. Uh, Steve was actually the first person that I interviewed. I interviewed G man. I interviewed Brett King and I interviewed Alex Botton. And a, a lot of people out there will know those names, but they were, um, they were like the, the, the old school, I guess, in the, the amateur debate world and um it was good i haven't i haven't i'm waiting for the first year of our show when we turn one to release those interviews i've still got them but um talking to them really got me like like wow we should go deeper into this or we should have um them come on and talk together but in a not a debate a discussion because with the debates and the rigid format, all you're really doing is having one person come up and talk, the next person come up and talk. There's no interaction. There's no like being able to take a statement and dive deeper right then. You have to wait for the, you know, their 10 minutes to be done and then that moment's lost. So I said, we should do a maybe a, a discussion once a month. And uh, Steve said, yeah, let's try it. Let's do it. So we we booked um, two two discussions between uh, Reg Rhetoric and Nate Thomas was a flat earther, and then Kent Hovind and um, Doctor Mays, and it took off from there. And now we uh, we literally are book solid every day until the middle of November, and here we are. Wow, that's like that's it's only been a year. Is that yeah. possible? Wow, that's we, the thing where Shannon, first, where Shannon threw me because, like, I consider I Shannon like Miss Atheist, and she's she's. Our first yeah, video that's, was uploaded to YouTube on January the twenty seventh, so we still have three more months to go before it's a. This is this is uh, this is our ninth month being on. Wow, that's mind boggling because I consider it like you guys have been around forever. And actually, I probably no, started feels, earlier than than you did. It feels so. like we have. I I think with with the amount of um, like, and uh, to be completely honest with you, the uh, the people and the uh, the guys that that watch and leave comments and um, support us are the entire motivation and why we are where we are today. I mean, it's just it's been unreal the response and it's very humbling. It's uh. It, it makes you take a step back because a year ago you would never be able to tell me that I would be a, a YouTuber in a year. I would have laughed at you, you know, <laughs> it would have right. been, it would have been so, you know, so far out there to me, but um, now I can't imagine doing anything else. And uh, I, I love what I do. And it's a lot of well, fun. a lot of, a lot of you guys in your crew. And I, I think I've pointed this out on other videos are on, are on the trajectory to be the Matt Dillahunty's and the Aaron Ra's of tomorrow, you know. Um, I forget who I originally theorized about that with, but that's, that's really where a lot of this is heading. Most of the people you know who at, I've had on my show are, you turn around two years from now and they're gonna be the, you know, the well-known atheists about town, um, if that's what Matt Dillahunty and Aaron Ra are in fact you know, the public faith of atheism and you'll have stories of like, oh, I was watching my first godless cranium video when I was 23 and, you know, yep. that's how it's going to uh, all go down. 
I would say that those those two are um, impossible shoes to fill, but those shoes that do fill them will um, be the right ones. And any of those guys that you're referring to would be um, just fantastic at leading whatever you know what whatever this is uh, year a couple years from now. Any of those guys, the, the uh, apology, a godless cranium, godless engineer. Uh, holy Kool-Aid, any of those guys would be, we'd be lucky to have them. So uh, I'm fine with, with... Cirrus the Skeptic. Cirrus the Skeptic and Shannon. Cirrus is a squirrel in um, three squirrels in a man suit. So by law, he can't. That's the atheist bylaws. And Shannon oh. is, a, is a woman, I'll have you know. So obviously she can't. Shannon is a woman. I, I do agree with that. I do agree with that assessment. To, she has to um, you know, be in the kitchen and, and do the ironing. That's oh, really wow. See, I couldn't even make that joke. That'd be too, <laughs> that'd be too off the charts controversial. Oh, why? But I will allow that. It's, uh, she, she would because there, there's some. And that's, that's the thing. She, no, someone, somebody would for sure bust my ass about it. Be like, yeah, he, sure. see, you hear him say, you hear him say women should be ironing in the oh, keys. One of those type of Christians. Listen. Tell them to lighten the fuck up. Shannon would die at that joke. And that's what it is, everyone. Uh, lighten up. The world is way too serious as it is. And if you are trying to be the the joke police or um, trying to tell people that they, they, that they can't make these jokes, even though that's just in reference to a particular factual time period that we had in America, I mean, that's the way that it was. I'm just, you know... Uh, referring to a uh, <laughs> a time that really existed, a historical and, fact. You're just you're just right. referencing historical facts. That was a little history lesson. That, get a life. That's what I say. If if you get angry about that and that upset you, uh, get a life. That's my that, that's my advice. Hey, I hear you. I hear you, Kyle. So um, this this struggle internally when you were. When you were uh, just a wee thing, when you're a young little rapscallion Kyle, and you're struggling, you knew that you were, did you suppress the information from yourself, or did you know you were gay in high school? And how strong is that? I, I have no idea. I mean, I have no idea how that works. I think both. Um, I, uh, I, probably my earliest memory of when I, I knew that, I was different. I was in middle school. We would always have um, twice a month. We'd have dances on Friday nights at this um, the school. And I remember being at a at the lunch table, eating our square pizza and horrible frozen corn. And um, my friend at the time was writing a, a letter or a note. One of those. I think it was one of those check yes or no's. You know. You know what I'm saying? Those love letters, but not really love letters, but. He was asking this girl to uh, dance with him. At the Go day. meet behind the meet behind the barn and smooch and something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. And he asked me, uh, "Who are you writing your note to?" And <laughs> you're like, uh, uh, "I haven't thought about it." Well, well, he didn't know. And obviously, the middle schoolers, we're not gonna. It's not a deep subject that we really cover. But I remember. Um, Stopping and going, well, if I had it my way, I would probably be asking you. I didn't say that out loud, of course, but I remember going, well, if I really, if you know, if I, we had to choose somebody to go to the dance with, it would be, it would be Ben. And uh, that was probably the most, the, the first that I can recall and the most striking, the one that, that stuck with me, where I was like, I don't have a desire to go with any of the girls. Is that normal? Is that a, you know, is that a, a bad thing, right? And in your in in the years that you were like, see, I, I, maybe things haven't changed that much. But I I grew up in New York, outside of New York City, and when I was in high school in the eighties, right? Now there was no openly gay person then, but I'm a hundred percent sure if you went to my high school, the same town today, there would be a lot. There'd be like at least ten. Or at least three in every grade. Like in my of my Facebook friends, you know, twenty out of two hundred people. That's pretty high percentage. <laughs> you know, that's it's like, 
Right, mm-hmm. but I, I, I think it would actually be, because this was already starting to happen in college, it would be considered kind of cool or chic or, you know, not necessarily like dangerous, but you know, how, you know how things are going nowadays in terms of the culture, depending on where you grow up. Like it's probably in the middle of the Bible Belt, it's still pretty shocking or weird. It's I don't, you tell me. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's dramatically different. It's, it's not where it should be, but it's dramatically different. And um, I don't know that I would call it cool or chic. I would just say that gay people are uh, awesome. And that chicness that you think it is, is really just being fabulous. I mean, that's just what being fabulous entails. <laughs> okay. Um, no, I just mean in terms of like, cause that it's was our, actually, yeah, I know. I got you. Um, just because, like, I don't know, that was already starting to happen when I was in college. See, the, the thing with me that's probably different than most Christians is I was a theater major in college, and I grew up in New York. So, you know, if you're a theater major, you know gay people constantly. Constant. Every, every theater class I've ever taken had at least three. Out of seven guys, three of them would be gay. At least. It is, you know. it is no coincidence that as the... The, as society is more accepting towards uh, the LGBTQ community, religion has taken a nosedive. They're correlated, and for a and for a very good reason. And the reason is because of what you just said. Everyone now that has friends has a gay friend. I will guarantee you that. Now, yes, there will be some people that don't, but. We all know them now. We we are out. You know, the, we're not hiding anymore, and that forces people to make a choice, whether it be consciously or subconsciously. That you either have to be willing to shun this person, this you know, uh, person that, that you either love or you you love as a friend. They've been there for you the entire time, or take a step back from the thing that's telling you to shun that person. And overwhelmingly society as a whole has chosen that um, they're not going to do that. And that's put a big dent in religion. I mean, if, if I think things would be different, a lot different in society, uh, the world, if religion had not beaten that drum and been more open to homosexuals, being a part of the church, feeling like they were included and not like they were some, um, you know, gross stain on society that doing that right there, I think in the long run, really, it it really cost the church because if you might have a different world, if they would have opened up those, uh, those doors, like they, like they claim they do. And people might, you might have 10 times more Christians now, if that would have been the case. But I think because, you know, they made that a, a hill they wanted to die on. It really, really, really uh, cost them. Well, they made it a hill they want to die on. That's that's probably, I think what you're saying is um, because it wasn't just someone who was, who was gay like you. It was, you know, then there was three people you know probably who grew up Christian, like maybe someone like Dan or something, who who couldn't take the, the church's attitude on gay people because they knew gay people. So they, th- it's not that they necessarily would have chosen. It's that you're saying that the church itself forced them to make a choice. Is that, is that what Correct. I'm hearing? Is that? And, and, and I'm saying that like the, the, the numbers and statistics show that um, uh, religion as a whole, uh, people who identify as non-religious are increasing. So that religion is decreasing as acceptance to same sex relationships is increasing at a dramatic rate. So what I'm saying is if the church had actually followed its teaching and that is love your neighbor as you love yourself, um, you know, treat others the way that you want to be treated and not made a push to ostracize gay people or to make them feel like they were an abomination or to make them feel like they needed to change. If they'd have opened those doors and said, you know what, you might be gay. It, it was a law back in, uh, you know, the Old Testament. 
just like uh, wearing mixed linen and eating shrimp. There's no difference. You can still eat shrimp now. You can still wear mixed linens now. So there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to um, you know, fall in love with whoever you want to. I think that the re religiosity in America would be stable, if not increasing, because uh, families are tied to churches. Um, and who doesn't want to still be included in that community? But because the church came out and doubled down on the um, the abominations, doubled down on the talk where it's it's a sin and it's just abhorrent to God, that forced people to force people to make right. If the it, people because a lot of what you're if I'm hearing you correctly, and I think there's a lot of truth in what you're saying that. As it plays out in the general population, no, not that many people have a dog in the fight one way or the other. Um, what I heard from someone like your friend Steve is he might not necessarily have had a dog in the fight had the church not taken a firm dogmatic stand on the subject of homosexuality. Absolutely. A lot of people. What's that? Absolutely. Then a lot of a lot of in between Christians would have had no real reason to, you know, choose sides against Christianity. Is that, that's Absolutely. kind of what you mean, right? As they don't, there, there's a preacher, uh, there's, the, there's an African-American preacher um, that, uh, I think his name's D, I cannot remember for the life of me, but he's on YouTube. If, if, you, if you Google, um, I believe it's African-American preacher, uh, preaches about gay from, being gay from the pulpit. Uh, this is a Southern uh, black pastor in front of his congregation getting up there and just letting loose kind of what I, to what I just said um, about the hypocrisy and what it's done to the church by their decision on, on how to handle that. And he says everything just perfectly. I mean, just perfectly about why the situation with people in religion is in the shape that it's in today. And that's because we pick and choose which rules we want to follow based on which ones make us comfortable. Same sex relationships made the, uh, the elders back there for whatever reason, uncomfortable. So they decided that that was going to be a, um, uh, an all or nothing for them. And for a long time, it was the dominant, uh, it was the dominant ideology. And then slowly, but surely as you got to, as science began to, you know, just uh, exponentially learn the answers to things that loosened those cracks, I believe, for the dam to come falling down, which was the uh, look at. OK, look at it this way. Look at the DOMA Act, the Defense of uh, Marriage Act and George W. Bush. It wasn't six years later that uh, when the DOMA was passed, it was by like a 55 percent margin, like 55 percent of the of the country. Uh, voted to uh, keep marriage between a, a man and a woman, whatever the, I believe the number was 55%, uh, percent, if I'm not mistaken. Within six years, that number had not only flipped, but it increased. And why is that? Well, that's because, because yeah, that's because of the popular, popular culture. A lot of people have pointed this out, and I think this is really astute, that um, it Conservatives have won political political battles, and they they've doubled down on you know the the reason why the religious right grew is because the politics behind it, and they got good at the localized politics. But the people on the left and people who would want to uh, you know t make more tolerant attitudes towards homosexuality control the culture. They're Hollywood, you know they they control what we watch, you know, and what we go movies we go to. And that's Absolutely. really what makes the difference because you, sure. you, 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 you put in, it's like if you saw 13 reasons why, you know, the, the tough guy is gay. <laughs> You're like, what, what? come on. It starts to get a little bit, a little bit too obvious. You're trying to like, you know, win an argument by strategic placing, but it's, it's why it happened. It changed attitudes Absolutely. dramatically. I, I think it, it was, it was definitely a big part of that, but my point, my point to that is, look what's happened since then. The world hasn't ended. In fact, in many ways, it's gotten better. It's Doesn't it feel better to be more tolerant and to know that 
people can really be who they are without it crumbling the uh, the fabric of society like was uh, preached for so many years. I mean, it's just a uh, it's a thing that never needed to be ha- like slavery or uh, discrimination, segregation. Uh, once we woke up and realized that, hey, maybe the way that we're treating a group of people just because they are different, maybe that's not right. Maybe maybe there's something to that. And uh, people in today's society could never imagine a time where uh, black people would have to drink from their own water fountain or they couldn't sit at a, uh, a lunch counter or they couldn't ride a bus at the front that they had to give up their seat for um, a white person. That is unconscionable to people like uh, to our generation and it should be it should be abhorrent it should make you sick to think that that was ever the way that people treated other people in a uh, a world or a country like ours and it's the same thing as we go through time we look back and we realize that maybe the dogma and, and most of this honestly uh, not to not to pick on religion or anything but most of it stems from that the, uh, the the Bible was used several times to justify the, the segregation, the, the mixing of the yoke. Uh, it And once we get past that, we realize that, wow, maybe we took a lot of uh, – maybe we in, inflicted a lot of pain on a group of people, and maybe we took a lot from them just because they dared to be different or just because they didn't look like we did or just because they didn't love like we love. And I think that – no matter how you do it, whether it be through the media or uh, through grassroots movements and protesting, through writing letters, through uh, uh, civil disobedience, through anarchy, any way that you can to introduce that kind of change into society, I, I defy someone to show me where that's not the way and that's not the right thing to do. So let me, on um, playing off of that, let me ask you, because uh, there are two things that happened, and I'm interested in your take. First of all, there once upon a time, the religious right was not actually a thing. Um, if you go back to the Jimmy Carter era, um, people, sure. I, you, prob- you know who Michelle Bachman is, right? Of course I do, and I know exactly where the religious right came from. Uh, from the moral majority, from what's his face, right? Absolutely, it's, uh, absolutely. Uh, Roger Ailes. Oh, I was. Oh, wait. Were Roger Ailes back then, or Roger Ailes from Fo- because of Fox News? Roger Ailes from Fox News, but when he worked on the uh, the abortion um, campaigns, when that when that abortion decision was was made on, they saw an opportunity to really. Uh, clumped together in a collective to try to push back against this abortion thing. He was a, uh, a strategist in that entire. Uh, right. Of- that, okay. That's, that's what I thought you meant. So in, yeah. in Michelle Bachman in the seventies was uh, in 76 worked on Jimmy Carter's campaign. He was a famously born again, Christian. A lot of people don't know that, you know, because he's a Democrat, the liberal Democrat wouldn't even perceive of it that way. That's when the, what's that? Back then they would, back then, even the Democrats, back then you had, even the Democrats had to be, uh, if you seem to falter in your belief or devotion to God, um, there's no way you would ever have a chance in hell. So of course, yes, uh, people like Jimmy Carter and John F. Kennedy, you know, the, the, the proud Catholic, um, right. Exactly. You had to cling on to that. Absolutely. Right. Exactly. And then as a political movement, the religious right gained power. And, you know, there's a lot of there was a lot of there was a lot of uh, cross pollination between the idea of being Christian and being in the right. And those don't necessarily go hand in hand. That's part of a social movement rather than, you know, an actual I've analyzed the Bible and now I should be Republican. I the agree. the question I was the question I was going to ask you is how does your grandmother remember you said your grandmother is the perfect example of of what you what you would if you had an, a role model Christian said this is how a Christian should act you you mentioned her yeah. how does she deal with these type of things what what would what would Granny do when she's faced in, with these challenging social questions 
Which, in terms of uh, you said granny i'm granny i'm gay what, what would what would granny do so that's nice dear i'll bake you some oh, what did you do <laughs> i did tell granny that uh, i did tell granny that i was gay and her uh response to me was no wonder you always commented on my dresses <laughs> and then she baked you some cookies and everything was all right that was it. Is that how it went down that was it there there was um she did not uh I was her I was her grandchild and that was what was most important and that's the way that it should be it um it was not and I'm not I'm I'm trying to speak for her but um and I can't get in her mind it may have uh, upset her I don't know what happened after um I left her or when I'm not you know in her company but she's never been anything different to me she never um she she will still tell me from time to time that um that God loves me and that she just wanted me to know that. And that's as far as she'll push it. But she doesn't say, uh, I need to get you, we need to get you right. Because, uh, you know, if you, if you were to die tomorrow, you, you would burn hell. It's not that. And you know what happens? She could, she could probably have a better chance. If I wasn't in the middle of like uh, the, the whole atheist and, and Christian thing. And I didn't, I wasn't as read up on all of the stuff as I am, if I'd have just been like Kyle and regular life before YouTube, uh, right. Saying things like that, like just, I just want you to know that, that, that God loves you. Uh, God still loves you. Those things do more good than telling someone that they're going to burn for eternity or that, um, they're an abomination. Leaving oh, those little, I mean, that's, little, that's a given. Those, right. And that's the way, and that's that's what people, that's what these Christians miss about the Bible, is that that's the way that it it that it's trying to push you to be treat others the way you want to be treated, love your neighbor as you love yourself, leave those seeds. There there are so many times that the Bible mentions planting the seed. That's a seed. Amen. Amen. Letting somebody know that uh, hey, God still loves you, and leave it at that. That sticks with somebody. But you know what's going to push them as far away from you and as far away from the other side and make them want to come after you with everything that I've got. When you put, put your finger in somebody's face and say, because you want to love who you love, you're going to burn for all of eternity. That is the quickest way to ensure someone stays an atheist. If you want to, if you right. Well, they, atheist, first of all, they feel hated. You, you, you feel hated by that person and th that's not, you don't feel like oh, that person doesn't like me at all and they want nothing to do with me. So you're not going to listen to them. You're going to totally tune them out, but go ahead. Yeah. No, it, it just doesn't make it, it uh, just the, the, the logic aspect of it doesn't make sense to me. There's a, uh, a worn out cliche saying that, that you know, you attract more, uh, uh, what is it? You attract more bees, with flies honey with honey. honey. Yeah, yeah, more I've, bees with honey. And it's it it is dead on. And I wish if 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 Christians really care for the souls of people like they say they do, then they should probably start talking to the soul and stop yelling at the sin or what they deem to be the sin. The moment that you do that is the moment that if you have any chance, it's the moment that you're going to be able to break through to that person because the degrading them and telling them that uh, just because they want to be who they are, that makes them uh, lower or not worthy or uh, anything like that is just disgraceful. And uh, and let me let me say this in in kind of closing because I've got I do have to get ready for my um, my show here in just a little bit, um, but. I, if it were me, and uh, if, if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, and I die, and it turns out that there is a, uh, the, the God of the Bible, the Christian God, and it turns out that he is exactly what those, uh, you know, bigoted Christians, I call them, are, those ones that, that throw that kind of fury and fire in your face, then I don't think that's a God worth worshiping for all of eternity i don't think that any any grand architect that would take the time to create life in a way that he did so 
uh, so detailed, so, um, I mean, just every last thing planned out that wound up in the perfect set of circumstances to allow for life on this, uh, on this planet. If he went through all this time, if he went through uh, all of these years watching and um, at times intervening and at times letting that, those painful things come around, uh, I, I don't see that kind of creator that would throw such a large portion of his creations, more than three quarters. If, if the, the Christian God is the one that's correct, that means all the other ones are wrong. That means that three quarters of the, the things that he made by hand and that he knew by name and he knew the hairs on their heads, he is going to burn alive those creations, three quarters of them for eternity. It is unconscionable for me to accept that that is the case. It, it does not make sense. It doesn't make, a, uh, it, it is not right. And if it turns out that that is true, that the one that um, knew everybody by name did throw three quarters of his creations in a, uh, a, an endless pit of hell, then you will not catch me worshiping a God like that. And I'm fine being thrown in with the rest of them because at some point you have to have the uh, the moral fiber inside of you to take a step back and look at what's right and what's wrong. Just simply put that way, what's right and what's wrong. And think about this. Are you worshiping that God out of fear of going to hell or because you want to go to heaven? If those things were taken off the table and you just, cease to exist when you die would you still love god the same that's the question that i always ask uh christians if the 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 punishment and the reward were taken off the table what would your relationship be like with god i guarantee you for the majority it would be radically different possibly possibly um the, the thing I will say about the first part of what you said is you're supposed to be an ambassador for Christ. An ambassador does not pick the boniest thorn of contention between you and someone who is not a Christian and start throwing it in their face. So that's not actually good stewardship. It's not actually trying to, trying to, or what a good ambassador does is take the parts that you both agree on. You know, the parts that you both like, yes, that's, I, we both think the same thing. And then you work from there. Um, you don't take the part where the person is the furthest away and you go, you know, you're going to burn in hell for that. That's just not, yeah. it's not wise. That's why, that's why I said if, if more Christians were like you, there would not be a, uh, an atheist versus theist thing. It would just be those who uh, believed and those who just didn't have a belief and you have these well, but you also you also put your finger on the the role of the christian you at least got enough evangelical training is to plant seeds it's not it's not for me to you to come on my show and me to convince you that jesus is real in the concept in the context of my show that isn't how it works and the, the best the best thing the best case scenario for me if even if evangelizing is my goal let's just say not sure that's what it is for the show, but let's just say it was. It's just to plant seeds. It's just to, you know, the best seed in this situation would be just to listen to somebody. So you go, okay, Christians can listen. <laughs> Christians can listen without. Well, this is the way that know. it should be. And this is why I'm glad you're doing this. Like, you should be able to have these deep conversations between people who have radically different ideologies and it not be about winning one to the other side. It just being about a conversation on uh, why the other takes the position that they do. Like this is not a – should not be a contest, should not be keeping score. This is just a conversation. And right. if more people were able to have these kind of conversations, there wouldn't be the, tor the, the, the turmoil that you have in, in every uh, situation uh, across the globe. If everybody uh, – is simple. If everybody uh, worried about themselves and worried about what they need to do, let's, for a Christian, let's say if you are a Christian, worry about 
how your relationship is with God. Right. And that's it. And let well, the other people decide if they wanted to have that relationship. And if they didn't, then you've got way too much to look after on your plate to worry about anything else that anybody else is doing. The world will be in a right. better place. That's, that's one of the reasons why I put out a video on this, and I'll probably put out more in the future. But one of the reasons why I don't, I don't take your beliefs, you, you personally, Kyle, I don't take your beliefs personally. You can believe what you want. You come on my show and I ask you questions and you're cool to me. It doesn't really matter to believe me to what you believe when you go home at night. I don't even understand that mindset. Yeah, I'm supposed to, on some level, witness the gospel or evangelize. I feel like I do a sufficient job of that. I don't need to do that while you're sitting here right in front of my face. I just yeah. want to find out what, how you got, you know, when you ask me, what are we going to do? This is exactly how I planned this show was going to go. You were going to sit here and tell me how you got to where you got and feel hopefully non-defensive doing it. Correct? No, not at all. And, and that's a, uh, that's a thing that, that I can't do on our show. We have um, so many people, uh, like a, such a wide a range of people that come on our show and it's never like, we might get into passionate uh, back and forths, but when the, the show ends, um, I'm able to, be completely pleasant and like, um, you know, none of the shouting or anything like that happened because I separate the, uh, you know, the the passionate back and forth from the individual. Like, it, I don't take it personal. You said it perfectly. And you can't take it personally because I have nothing against the people that I have come on the show that it may seem like I have disagreements with. I have a lot against the the ideas. And that's who what I'm talking to when we have those discussions. But um, I can still be uh you know i'm really good friends with a lot of christians i don't um i i don't take it beyond that you know what i'm saying it's not a it's not a campaign for me to try to um either uh, get you to our side so to speak or to um you know shut me down and right yeah it's just one, it's right just no that's why i thought that's why i thought you'd be a good guest because i i got that already people who i invite on my show i've already picked up on that fact uh, it's not it's not some sort of random coincidence, you know. I, I've already seen them publicly and said, "Hey, that guy will be cool and reasonable." And you know, um, there's why something to be you? learned. Why I did or why didn't I? I didn't. Why Steve invited. Steve's the only one who invited himself. He invited himself. Everybody else, I invited. He said he watched Drews and he said, "Hey, I'll come and tell you about playing with the Ouija board." And, how I conjured up the devil or something like that. And I was like, yeah, it sounds like a good show. Let's, let's, let's never roll. bring up agnosticism. You'll, you'll never leave. Yeah. It'll be the, uh, the hangout that never ends. Yeah. But then he'll do that. Like splitting of hair. That that's the, the one conversations that drive me mad on, <laughs> on these type of things. When people do the defining terms for like, yeah. an, well, an agnostic really means, you know, no, well, an actual, an atheist agnostic is <laughs> and you're like, ah, kill myself it's now. Bad. It's important to uh, it's important to define your terms and try to make sure you're on the same page. But I completely agree with you in the fact that um, there's only so many definitions for the word no. Like when you say, "What do you mean by the word no?" Uh, right. Like there's uh, there's only so many definitions that you can um, you can do from that. But I agree. But yeah, man, this has been um, this has been excellent. I've got uh, I hate that I have to kind of dive out, but we've got yeah. It's been it's been two it's been two and a half hours at least. So. This is exactly how I thought it was going to go, Kyle. And as I said to Cirrus, you know, the door's open anytime you want to come in and chat, run your little head off about whatever, how, how terrible the world is, you know, feel free. Shoot me a DM and we'll set something up. The world, let me end on this. The world, everyone, is not terrible or bad. And people at their very core, for the most part, are good. Even if you disagree with them, theologically people I believe at their core are good sometimes people get misguided but the world's a beautiful place and if I'm right you only get to experience it once so do everything that you can to make the most of every single day and anything that gets in the way of you living life the way you want to and to maximize the happiness that you have throw it out and live 
and I appreciate it, Craig. Hey, man, anytime, my friend, anytime. Good chat. And with that, we will. What? We'll sign Sweet. off. Sweet. Good deal, man. Cool, man. Yeah, let me go. Let me go kill the kill the mic. Hold on. Yeah, it was great. Good deal.